Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. We're happy to have uh, Alexandre Stauffer from Berkeley, and he's going to... <coughs> uh, Tell us about Poisson brain in motions and their <laughs> and the <laughs> continuum percolation in the mobile environment. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm assuming everybody can see above this line, okay? <laughs> oh, sorry. So let me start. Oh, first of all, let me say that this is the joint work with uh, Alistair Sinclair. So I'll start defining the model in a simulation. So we start with a Poisson point process in the plane. And for the simulation, we're just going to take a finite torus just to make it more beautiful and appealing. But we can assume it's the whole plane. And then I'm going to draw balls of radius, say, 1, centered at each point of the point process. And I'm going to see this as a model for a wireless network, where each point of the point process is a node of the network. And we're going to say that two points are neighbors if their balls intersect, like in these two points. And they are not neighbors if the ball doesn't intersect. The two balls don't intersect, like these two ones. Yeah. So this model is, in some sense, called random geometry graphs. right? So for the closer friends, we just call it RGG. And I forgot to say, but the Poisson point process has intensity lambda over the whole plane. So it's intuitively, as we increase the value of lambda, we expect more and more nodes to be showing up in this picture. And we have more and more, say, edges of the graph, or say an edge when the balls intersect. And of course, the connect components of this graph will be bigger. So let me add more nodes to the picture. So we are going to get a picture like this. And it's known that there exists a critical value, lambda c, such that if lambda is larger than lambda c, then there exists an infinite component of the graph, which we are going to call the giant connect component, GCC. And just to illustrate this case, I'm going to take this example and I'm going to erase the balls around the points that do not belong to the largest component. So just to give an example in the picture. So all the balls you see are part of the largest component of this example. So we see that many nodes belong to the largest component. And in particular, the largest component is span the whole region. So it it's present on the top, and you can find a path going through here, maybe. Uh, you can find a path, believe me. <laughs> and <clears throat> so that there exists a giant component, but the graph is not connected. Right? There, you see nodes here that do not belong to this largest component. And these two facts, the existence of the giant component, it, the graph not being connected, occurs with probability 1 in the model of the whole plane. And when there exists a giant component, we are going to look at what happens with the origin of the plane. In particular, in this setting, the probability that the origin, I'm going to denote like this, does not belong to the giant component is going to be some constant eta that's strictly between 0 and 1. Okay. So by belong and not belong, I mean the origin belongs to that component if it's in one of these balls that I illustrate here, one of the balls centered at the nodes that are part of the infinite cluster, infinite component. So as a model for networks, the fact that the graph is not connected is a pretty serious drawback. So we're going to consider a 
particular subset of wireless networks, in particular mobile wireless networks, where you can think of nodes being people carrying their cell phones, right? And they are moving around, and every time a person is close to another cell phone, the two cell phones can exchange message. See? So translating to this model, what you are going to do is you are going to create a model of a graph that evolves with time. So at time that here is the mobile case, so at time zero, I will start with, ah, uh, not the ECC. I will start with a random geometry graph in the way I just defined in the picture. And each node will perform, will move as a Brownian motion. So how we start with this picture that each node moves according to a Brownian motion. But just to simplify my life, I'm going to observe the model in discrete time steps. So we are going to observe times 0, 1, 2, and so on. So I really don't care what happens between 0 and 1. I'm just observing times 0 and 1. So let's see. Let's see what happens. We start with a random geometric graph. And then we let the nodes move according to a Brownian motion. And I'm sampling the nodes in discrete time steps. So as you can see, since this Brownian motion is in two dimensions, the nodes essentially stay around their initial location here, for example. But the edges of the graph change substantially. For example, this node here, it's isolated this time. It's not connected to anyone. And hopefully soon, oh, huh? uh, that's it. <laughs> it gets connected to someone. And there are some interesting properties. If I let this simulation run forever, and at some moment, not forever, but at some moment I stop it, and I ask you to forget everything you have seen before, and just look at this picture now, you are going to see that it looks pretty much like the same random geometry graph. Right? And the fact is that's true, because the Brownian motion applied to this process preserves the measure of the random geometry graph. So at any time, so at any time, fixed time i, what you observe is exactly a random geometry graph. So this model inherits properties of the random geometry graph. For example, there exists a giant component at any fixed time with probability 1. The graph is not connected, and the origin does not belong to a giant component with some probability eta. So you can say, well, if the graph is not connected, then it didn't help much, right? We didn't have a, we had a non-connected graph before, and we still have a non-connected graph before now, and what's the point, right? So the point is, as, for example, at this time, this node here, it's, it's not connected to any node, but if you wait some steps, these nodes will move, and at some point, it must get connected to someone. Right? So that's, that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for connectivity over time here. So just me to illustrate, I'm going again to erase the balls that do not belong to a giant component. I'll let the nodes move, showing you the largest component at each step. So you see that the nodes move very slowly, but the giant component changes significantly from one step to another. So nodes that are initially very say, isolated, like these ones, they may at some time connect to the giant components and be able to communicate with many nodes in the system. So what we're going to look at here is how long does it take for a typical node to connect to the largest component. Right? So that concludes the beautiful part of the talk. So there will be no more simulations. So can you please send the screen up? Oh, it works. <laughs> okay. So let's let me do now formalize the question. So we assume that lambda is larger than lambda c, and 
I say that I define this random variable t perk to be the minimum time i such that the origin belongs to the giant component at that time i, which I denote as GCC sub i. And we want to say, to look at the probability that this random variable is larger than some value t, which is equivalent to say, of course, that's the probability that the origin has not been in the giant component at time i for all i up to time t minus 1. So I want to look at this probability. So the first thing you can say is that this event, the origin not belongs to a giant component at time i, is monotone in the sense that if this event doesn't hold for a certain instance, if I delete nodes, it is still going on to hold. Right? So, of course, you can then apply the FKG inequality. And the first thing you can get is that this probability is larger than the probability for a single, a fixed time i, which we define as eta, to the number of steps. And the first question you could ask is whether you can get an upper bound that's also exponential in t. And the answer to this question is no, at least in I mean, I guess this requires knowing a little bit more of a random geometric graph, because if you delete some nodes, and potentially which component is the giant component? Change well, or? no, no, the giant component is unique. Right? In the infinite. Yeah, but, yes. but that's a theory. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thanks. And <clears throat> so we know by the FKG inequalities that this, lower, this exponential lower bound holds. So the question we may ask is whether we can prove an exponential upper bounds. And I said that the answer is no, at least in two dimensions. And I'm not going to talk much about that, but there is, you can use work on space coverage for random geometric graphs and Poisson point process to show that this probability is larger than uh, exponential in some constant t over log t for two dimensions. Right? And <clears throat> so now we, we want to see what's the best upper bound we can get to this probability. And that gives us our theorem. Our theorem says that for two dimensions, the probability that t perk is larger than t is, is smaller than some exponential some constant square root of t for two dimensions. Or more general, our theorem applies to higher dimensions, which gets the bound e to the minus c t to d over t d plus 2. But I'm going to focus now in two dimensions only. Right? So now from this point to the end of the talk, my goal is to try to give an idea on how to prove this, this, uh, this upper bound. So is there any questions so far? No, great. So let's see what you can do to prove this. So what we need is to get a hold on this probability. In particular, if we fix a time I, we want to get the probability that the origin is not at the infinite cluster at that time, given that it hasn't been before. So I have to condition the fact that the, the origin has never been the giant component before. And this event is quite of hard to imagine. What does a point process look like if you condition the origin not being the infinite component before that time? So what I'm going to want to show is that the first step in the proof is that we want to skip delta steps. So now we are going to observe times 0, delta, 2 delta, and so on. And the idea is that if you skip some steps, you are going to allow the nodes to move further away, and you hope for some mixing to be achieved. And 
which I, I'll make clear hopefully later. And the idea is for this mixing is you want to, the goal will be to show that the probability that the origin is not in the giant component at time i times delta now, condition on some sigma field in the previous steps is, is more than some constant eta prime. So the idea is to show that after I skip delta steps, this, this conditional event will be essentially the same as without the condition. It means nodes will move far away in such a way that what you are going to see in the process will be roughly a fresh Poisson point process. That's the main goal of our proof. <clears throat> so let's see how I'm going to do this. No, first, before going to prove the goal, it's, we can check easily that once we have this, then the theorem fo follows immediately because this gives that the probability that t perk is larger than t will be smaller than eta prime to t over delta since I'm skipping delta steps. And it comes as no surprise that I'm going to set delta to be square root of t, which will achieve the theorem. So from now on, let's try to prove this goal. And I'm going to do this in three basic steps. So the first step is, instead of looking at the whole plane, which is where this event lies, I'm going to restrict myself to a finite region of size L. Right? Take a square of size length L. And I'm going to take L sufficiently large so that looking at the event that the origin belongs to the infinite cluster is the same as looking at the event of the origin belonging to the largest cluster in this region. So I'm not going to give you the details on this part, but so it's... Dependent of t? No, no. Dependent. The L is dependent of t. Actually, it will suffice to take L to be of the order of t. confusing me here. So, mm -hmm. eta prime doesn't depend on t? Eta prime doesn't depend on t, yes. We're going to take delta depending on t. Yeah. Delta depends on t. Right. So, like, for, for what uh, values, I mean, I mean, the eta you're going to be able to achieve in the goal will depend on the delta you take. Right. No. No, no, no. Why can't we take really. delta equals one to get something even better? Oh, but then we cannot get the constant here. Right. Because so. essentially what I'm saying is that what we're going to see after this conditioning is a fresh Poisson point process, right? If you don't take delta sufficiently large, this process will be subcritical, for example. So how and then the you the mixing time of the I local. Don't take the goal to literally. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so we start with this box. We're going to look at what happens inside this box only. But to prevent, to prevent interference from the outside, we're going to control a larger region of size 2L. Right? So that whatever happens outside this region don't affect what happens in the box, essentially. It will be probably clear later on. So, <clears throat> so now, now that's the first step, it's very simple. And the second step is we are going to change the sigma field. So initially, the, the obvious sigma field you could think is the probability that the origin has not been a giant component in the previous steps. But now we're going to add conditions so that we can deal, handle this sigma field. And the condition I'm going to use is some notion of density. So let me first explain what to do. You take this big box and you tessellate it in small squares. It's, let me, you do the tessellation, the usual one, all the way, the whole box. And these small squares will have side length little l, right, which will all depend on t. 
And I'm going to say that a cell, which is this little box, so a cell will be dense uh, if uh, it contains at least some number of nodes. So this is for a fixed time. You look at a fixed time, a fixed cell, and say a cell is dense if it contains at least some number of nodes. And this number is the expected number of nodes in that cell, which is lambda L squared, times some 1 minus epsilon, where epsilon will be made sufficiently small in this series. So one that the cell is dense if it has slightly less, uh, it has more nodes than something slightly <coughs> smaller than the expectation. Right? And of course, since this, the number of nodes in the cell is a Poisson random variable, this event has high probability. In particular, the probability that the cell is dense, dense at time i, will be something larger than 1 minus some exponential value, minus some constant lambda L squared. This is for a fixed cell and the fixed time i. And we, ex we can extend this to all cells and all times, so that we have probably that all cells are dense at all time i will be just the union bound, so the number of cells times the number of steps. Okay. And <clears throat> so, we are going to work with these events that the cells are dense at all time i's. And now we're going, let me show you how to relate L with delta. So the idea is we set delta sufficiently large so that after delta steps, a node can walk anywhere inside its cell and even further away. So, so essentially, we want delta to be, oh, not A, but delta. <laughs> We want delta to be some large constant times L squared, so that we can move anywhere in the cell. So since delta is going to be square root of t, as I said somehow, somewhere, where, there, where is it? It's here, yeah, <laughs> great. So as I said here, we have that L squared is also square root of t. Right? So this, this event, hmm? L squared, L squared right? is equal to square root of t. So this event will hold, will not hold, say, with probability exponentially small in square root t, which is of the same order as the theorem we want to, to get. And that's exactly the limitation of why we only could get square root of t, because this value must be at the same order as this value, the t over delta, okay? <clears throat> given this condition. It has to be satisfied. So now that's, that's going to be our sigma field. So our sigma field will be at the previous step, not only the origin has not been in the giant components, but also all cells will be dense at all the previous steps. And I'm going to use this to show that what we're going to see is itself a Poisson point, or contains some Poisson point process. So that's the, the part for the rest of the, the talk. So how, let's see how we use the density. So take a fixed cell of size L. And we know that it's dense, so we know there are many nodes in this cell. We don't know where they are, how they are distributed, it doesn't matter. We just know there are many of them, so more than one minus epsilon nodes. And I'm going to put inside this cell a fresh Poisson point process. A fresh Poisson point process with intensity smaller than this, a little smaller than this, 1 minus epsilon square lambda. Right? So I'm going to add Poisson point process to this cell and all the other cells inside this big box of size 2L with intensity smaller 
then the minimum number of nodes we are seeing. So we have some nodes here. Let's draw as a cross, for example. And since with high probability, the number of cross will be, much, will be smaller than the number of blue points. right? So we are able to match each cross to one blue point, and we can do this in an arbitrary way. It doesn't matter which point we choose. It only matters that each blue point is matched only to one red cross. And now I'm going to let the blue points and the red cross move according to a brown emotion for delta steps. But note that since these guys are at the same cell, the distance must be smaller than the diameter of the cell, L square root of 2, right? But delta is of the order C, L square. So after delta steps, these both nodes are able to traverse this distance, no matter how I couple them. And that's the main part, because if I take C sufficiently large, it's easy to show that we can couple this, the motion of these two nodes so that after delta steps, they go to the same location with high probability. So you can say that this, the red cross and its partner move to the same location with probability 1 minus epsilon c by setting c sufficiently large with respect to epsilon. Okay. So when you have this, you know that the red cross that couple with their partner forms itself a Poisson point process by thinning this one with probability 1 minus epsilon. So it's a new Poisson point process with intensity 1 minus epsilon cubed times lambda. Let me just ask a question. Yeah. Why? So not all, you notice that all of them are coupled, just so, huh? I don't need all of them to be coupled. All, right. all, all the red cross, not all the blue. Right. So, but, what, but you don't need all of them. Are all the red crosses to be coupled, or just some of them? No, completely coupled to the same location, just some of them. Just so those that are not maybe special ones, why? I mean, you said thinning, but... But they're random ones. No, no. You can't couple them. So, so that's... Okay. okay. Those that travel somehow... Maybe, maybe let me explain the coupling. What? Let me explain the coupling. Yes. It's maybe easier to see. So the coupling is... You take a pair and are going to choose a position for the red cross first. Right? So say you choose this position and suppose the distance here is, say, z. So I'm going to give you a sub-density that shows the, how to move x to the position at distance t. And the subdensity will be essentially a normal distribution, which is the usual for the Brownian motion, so 1 over 2 pi delta, exponential. But instead of having z is square uh, to delta, only, I have z plus z, z, z plus l square root of 2 square. So instead of the usual brown emotion, I will hide on where I had this L square root of 2, I just add this extra term. So this is, of course, is smaller than the density of the brown emotion point-wise. Right? And not only that, but if you take this, the partner of the red cross, the density of him moving there is also larger than the subdensity. Right? Because by the triangle inequality, this distance is more than L square root of 2. Two pairs so, independently. No, no, but the, the main trick is that this subdensity does not depend on the location of the blue point. So now, now I guess I'm confused. If you have two, two red crosses mm -hmm. are coupled, uh, these two No, you so couple the red and the blue, you don't couple the red. Sorry, yeah, but like the event that one is coupled and the other is coupled, are these independent? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But yes, that's, that's not enough. That's not enough for the thinning? Why not? Because you want to know that the thinning doesn't depend on location. Yeah. Right. Okay, with ah, this particular okay. company. <laughs> <laughs> 
we explained the way which where it doesn't depend. It just depends on the distance that comes with the probability between them. The distance between the red and the blue. The, the event shouldn't depend on the final location of the world. Um. <laughs> Any more questions so far? Thanks. Uh, so that's how we do the coupling. And we know that doing this coupling, what we show that to get this 1 over epsilon is just that if you integrate over z, we get the 1 over epsilon for some large enough c in the definition of delta. So that gives you the probability that they couple to the same location. And this forms a Poisson point process with intense 1 minus epsilon cube times lambda. But that's not the end of the story, because what we know now is that to have a Poisson point process condition that they will couple. But we didn't make the move yet. The move must be made for after delta steps, but we made it according to this density, because it's the condition on uh, they coupling. So <clears throat> what we have is that at, we have inside this big box a Poisson point process of red crosses. And we are going to let them move according to that particular density. And it's easy to see that that density, uh, well, if th that density would preserve the measure if the Poisson point process was on the, on the whole plane. But it's not. It's only on the. 2L by 2L box. So what we need to show at the last step is that they, after making the motion, they you know some mass of intensity from here will go out, some mass of intensity from here will go really out, some mass here will go in, but there is no mass coming out here to inside. So the intensity will decrease a bit, but not too much because this distance is very large. This distance has all the T, and we're just moving square root T. So <clears throat> what we can show is that, for example, being generous here, we can get another Poisson point process with intensity 1 minus epsilon 4 times lambda. Right? And then we just set epsilon so that this is larger than lambda c. Well, we, we had assumed that lambda is strictly larger than lambda c. So we can always set epsilon. So by doing this, we know that the red cross the, the red cross will be a supercritical uh, random geometric graph. So in particular, we prove the goal. And once we prove the goal, we have the result immediately. And that essentially concludes the, the proof. Let's put it here. And also the talk. <laughs> Thanks. Questions? What would be your guesses to the real? Uh... Oh, the real one? <clears throat> uh, for two dimensions, I'm pretty sure the real one is matched the lower bound. We weren't able to prove it, but we believe that's the, the right answer. You should say that this lower bound is computing some probabilities, when you say but in what? So <clears throat> this lower bound comes from the probability. Here we say the probability that the origin belongs to the infinite cluster. Okay? So you can look at the probability that the origin is adjacent to any node. So it's run your process until some node, some, some ball hits the origin. Okay? So this is how we get this low amount. So we have the probability that the origin is isolated for t steps is decayed exponentially in t over log t. So I think that perhaps the, the lemma that I didn't, what you got to about there and the goal? Uh, next to goal, yes. So you think that this would be actually true with delta equal uh, C yeah. log T, but, yeah, my, but my hope that this is this should be true for delta log T, but then we need to show a better result on the density. Because yeah. that's the, the limitation here on the, on our proof.
But if, if what you were interested in was simply whether it's ever had a neighbor or not, then you know this is the right answer? We know this is tight. Yeah. Yeah. We have an open rule about it. Well, it's known from, from the space coverage result, and we have a generalization for some case. So I have an upper lower bound for this, for this particular problem. So you don't have a better lower bound in d bigger than 2? So for d bigger than 2, the lower bound for this, from this setting is exponentially in t. So that's the best. It's like as, as good as the FKG in the It's known that for the coverage form, the probability is e to the minus the volume of the wiener sausage at time t. So you have this union of balls up to time t. And they, that union grows linearly in the dimension. Either in 3 or like t over log t. Think of the range of a random walk. So that's, but that's just for coverage. Yeah, just just. Any more questions? Thoughts? Solutions? Okay, thank you again. Yeah.